Hello and welcome to the new Phi Compass Jam session podcast. I am Anna Zurek from the Phi Compass team at the European Investment Bank, and I am pleased that you have joined us for today's podcast in which we are going to discuss quasi equity as a financial instrument product and answer your questions about the ERDF quasi equity model financial instrument, which is published on the Phi Compass website. We will link the publication in the transcript of this podcast episode for those who would like to read it. We presented the ERDF quasi-equity model financial instrument during the FICOMPASS event in October 2022, and we received some really good questions, which we took as an occasion to prepare this podcast episode. By the way, the video recording of this FICOMPASS conference, including this session about the quasi-equity model financial instrument, is available on our website, and we will link this as well in this episode's transcript. And now I am pleased to welcome two great guests for this episode. Our first expert joining us today is Sara D'Agostini. Policy Officer at the Financial Instruments and International Financial Institutions Relations Unit at DG Regio. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Hannah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and talk about the new model of quasi-equity finance for uh, SME. We are also joined by Markus Lehmann, Finance Director at EBB Ventures, the Fund Manager of the ERDF Co-Finance VC Funds in Berlin, who has kindly agreed to share his practical experiences with quasi-equity investments. Welcome, Markus. Hi, Anna. I'm happy to be here. So before we turn to our questions, Sarah, could you please give us a quick introduction to the ERDF quasi-equity model financial instrument, as well as a definition, what equity, what quasi-equity is uh, as financial instrument products, what are their purpose? Sure. First of all, let me explain the idea of uh, this model. So the idea of focusing on a quasi-equity model came in the context of the COVID pandemic. During the crisis, liquidity was abundant, but during and especially after the SME clearly needed equity capital. The equity market has remained overall quite stable during the crisis and has proven resilient. The few existing equity ecosystems continue to function in Europe, but at the same time, the need of expanding the number of equity ecosystems has grown. Now, equity and quasi-equity usually coexist as product as they are provided by the same financial providers. From ERDF experience, the implementation of an equity instrument has proven effective for the development of the ecosystem in few member states, for example, Greece, Sweden, and probably not least in the Berlin area. In the previous programming period, we had an off-the-shelf instrument focused on equity. In this programming period, our choice falls on the quasi-equity finance for SMEs. Now, what is an equity instrument? Equity is the provision of risk capital and management expertise in return for ownership. What is quasi-equity? Quasi-equity is an instrument with some equity feature and also some debt feature. For example, in our model, we have focused on subordinated loans, not in the form of convertible debt. They bear a higher interest rate than standard loans, but lower than equity. They rank junior to standard loans, but senior to equity in case of liquidation. Subordinated loans bear therefore a higher risk than standard loans, but lower than equity. The condition of our model refers to non-convertible subordinated loans and might not be necessarily applied to other quasi-equity instruments. In our model, the loans may have a duration of 5 to 10 years. They will bear a favorable interest rate. There is no need of collateral and they are mainly targeting SMEs and mid-caps. These loans are meant to support new enterprises, early stage SMEs, expansion of capital, capital support in general activity, and so on. So full details can be found in the brochure in the FICOMPAC website. So you mentioned already a number of features of quasi-equity instruments. And one of the clear messages from the presentation at our conference in uh, October 2022 was that quasi-equity financial instruments may take many different forms, from subordinated loans to preferred shares. And can you confirm that this is correct? And how do you deal uh, with this uh, in the model? So indeed, as you said, quasi-equity instruments are not standardized product and they can take different forms, closer to equity or to debt. All this is left to the negotiation of the parties. In addition, uh, there is no predefined taxonomy in the market for this uh, type of instrument. In our model, within the different type of quasi-equity, we felt subordinated loan was better suited for early stages. Subordinated loans tend to be deployed in very early phases of innovative enterprises as the investor can have an approach, invest, wait and see. If the investment is successful, they can decide to proceed with subsequent equity investment. Otherwise, they can simply stop investing. 
Thank you very much, Sarah. So the model is based on a subordinated loan product, but other types of quasi-equity models can also be set uh, with ERDF resources, correct, Sarah? Correct. Actually, this is a very good question, Anna. Indeed, we have given preference to subordinated loans in our model to ease the design and implementation of this very specific type of quasi-equity. However, with the RDF, any other type of quasi-equity can be deployed, such as, for example, venture capital or participatory certificate. This model can be used to get inspired for the design and implementation of other type of quasi-equity. But in this case, not all features of this model can be directly applicable. Thank you very much, Sarah. And Markus, I think your quasi-equity product in Berlin is a convertible loan. Could you please describe how you use this type of product with uh, your portfolio companies? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, first and foremost, we are a venture capital fund, so we are an equity investor, but we use quasi-equity in combination in certain uh, situations and we use it uh, also quite often. There are For a venture capital investor, there are special situations where you do not want to record a valuation of a company. So in this situation, is mostly bridge financings. We use convertible loans and we also uh, used a lot of loans during the COVID crisis because convertible loans are often faster and easier, less formal. You do not have to go to a notary to uh, close a convertible loan. It's also the reason why uh, many other states in Germany use convertible loan programs during COVID crisis because there was uh, fast help was needed by the companies and uh, they didn't want to negotiate a valuation in this situation, but to help them fast and uh, postpone the valuation to a later point in time. That was the main reason why many convertible loans were used in this time. Thank you very much, Markus. This is really interesting to hear how you used quasi-equity in Berlin and how what kind of um, benefits it provided and how flexible this product was actually. And without telling us your commercial secrets, how do you set the conversion rate? Do you use uh, an interim valuation for, of the companies? Yeah, that's not really a secret. It's very standard to negotiate a certain discount on a future valuation. So the valuation is postponed to the future when new investor joining the company in the next finance round, you have a valuation of an external party and uh, lenders of convertible loans usually get a discount on this future uh, valuation. That it's most cases something between 20 or 30 percent of the valuation of the external investor because you have a higher risk because you invest earlier. Uh, the new investor who joins later has more information on the company and uh, so to compensate for the higher risk, uh, you get this discount. Uh, sometimes Sometimes you also see contracts where there is not only a discount, but also a valuation a cap, meaning there is a, a sailing for the valuation. So even if the new investor is accepting a higher valuation, the convertible loan lenders uh, have uh, this uh, contractual cap. And in some cases, is no external lender. There is uh, also the possibility of a conversion. There, there you often have a, a floor valuation. So it's a, a lower valuation. In most cases, this will be the, the valuation from the last financing round uh, before the loan was given. So many variants, but you can have a standard contract where you're always right in a 20% discount on the future financing round. So uh, this would be a, a possibility to use a standardized contract then. Thank you very much, Markus. So let's look at the questions that reached us regarding the quasi-equity model financial instrument at the conference. The first question is, how would financial intermediaries secure their part of the funding and what is the rationale behind their investing in such an instrument? This is a really interesting question for subordinated loans. For example, there will be little or no collateral. Is this reflected in the pricing? Sarah? Sure. So equity and quasi-equity instruments are usually provided by equity and venture capital funds. These intermediaries are different from conservative low credit risk banks. They target high risk, high return investment. Usually they work with no collateral as the enterprises at high growth and early stages simply do not have collateral available. The rationale behind this investor, which are also defined patient investors, are as the lifetime of an equity investment is usually 7 to 10 years. This investor is waiting until the enterprise reaches the break-even. 
and enter into the profitability phase. One out of four might fail, but some other can also ensure a three, four times return on investment. To conclude, as mentioned earlier, this instrument will bear higher interest rate to reflect the higher risk and the no collateral. Therefore, yes, it is reflected in the prices. Thank you very much. Marcus, would you like to complement? Yeah, that's uh, correct. Uh, there are usually no collaterals at all. As we, we don't work with collaterals. You even have in, in many cases also in the convertible loans a subordination clause, meaning your loan ranks behind uh, other external lenders, but before other equity investors. So it, it's in between. And yes, we usually don't get payback of these uh, loans, uh, but the loans uh, convert at a future point in time into equity. And with equity, you have the chance to recover much more than you have invested if the company is very successful. But on the other hand, you have a high risk also. So if the company fails, you don't uh, get anything out, out of a collateral or something like this. So uh, it's uh, risky like equity, but uh, if it converts then into equity, you usually have also an upside uh, like in an in equity investment. Thank you very much, Marcus. This was really insightful. And now to the next question. Regarding the pricing of the subordinated loans, we received a good question about state aid treatment. A practitioner commented that uh, the commission does not consider quasi-equity, such as subordinated loans, to be transparent aid. And this would mean that uh, the minimums cannot be applied without not notification. Is this correct? And what are the options to ensure state aid compliance for quasi-equity financial instruments? Sarah. So in our regulations, quasi-equity is listed as a financial product. The definition can be found either in the financial regulation and or in the GBER. And subordinated zones should fit into the definition of quasi-equity. In our model, quasi equity finance for SMEs, we have a detailed section about state aid rules that might apply for this type of product. In fact, state aid compliance should be ensured at financial intermediaries level and financial recipient level. Some possible grounds to ensure compliance with state aid rules are the de minimis regulation and the GBER, provided that all conditions are respected or also the risk finance guidelines, but subject to notification. But as I said, more detailed information can really be found in the fee compass brochure about the state aid. This is very helpful. Thank you very much, Sarah. And Markus, how do you deal with state aid in Berlin? I think you always invest pari passu uh, with market investors, correct? Yes, uh, if ever this is possible, we prefer this approach because it's uh, less risky. So if you have private investors uh, that are uh, giving the companies loans to the same conditions and uh, uh, right amount, uh, we uh, always uh, go this path uh, and uh, do pari passu, so no state aid in this situation. But as I mentioned uh, before, during COVID, for example, we do didn't have always these uh, independent private investors uh, because in most cases uh, we invested together with investors that were already on board in the companies. So they were not uh, really independent. And uh, in this case, uh, we used uh, the small aid scheme. Uh, it's not longer available, but uh, this was very good uh, regulation in this special situation during COVID. And uh, if uh, you look at uh, the, the GIBA, uh, one thing that could be usable is uh, this Article 22 for, for young companies. Uh, so in situations, you might use uh, maybe this uh, aid scheme because the whole amount of the loan has to be treated as a state aid if you don't have the, the pari passo. So the minimis could be uh, one option if the loan uh, loan amount is uh, below 200,000 euros or Geber uh, may be an option uh, if you have uh, a higher amounts. Uh, what we do not use is uh, uh, the, the reference rate approach. So if you have a certain threshold for the reference rate, this might be state aid conform, but we don't use this because uh, if we are lending to, to startup companies, to very young companies, uh, you can uh, come in a situation where uh, subordination is uh, required afterwards uh, if you don't have uh, this in the contract from the beginning or if the company doesn't develop estimated and they are not able to, to pay the interest rate, they may ask you for a postponement of, of interest. 
And uh, this uh, could bring you as a lender in a difficult situation where this loan that you have maybe regarded not as being a state aid because you have a, a high enough interest rate uh, becomes a state aid later on. So best way is uh, either doing pari passo, no state aid from the beginning, or uh, look for a stable uh, state aid compatible uh, approach. This would be uh, my recommendation if you are regarding state aid. Thank you very much, Markus. These are really interesting insights and recommendations. And now to the next question. We had actually one comment about a possible specific challenge with uh, quasi-equity financing. Quasi-equity is often targeting startup companies that are not yet profitable, and this can lead to difficulties due to their over-indebtedness, as a quasi-equity is not regarded as equity. And this can result in excluding them from ERDF financing. Sarah, is this uh, correct? And what's your view on this? Yes, quasi-equity is a financial product per se, which contains some feature of both equity and some feature of debt. I mentioned earlier the role of equity and quasi-equity as special investor and the readiness to accept higher risk, including the lack of profitability at the very early stages. Quasi-equity as such is in the list of the financial products mentioned in our regulation, not last in Article 217 of the CPR 2127, the same as loans, guarantee, and equity. So quasi-equity as financial product can indeed be used for the ERDF financing through the financial instrument structure. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Marcus, do you have a view on this as well? Yes, we have this problem in some cases because uh, ERDF excludes uh, companies in difficulties from getting a financing. And uh, if you have uh, startup companies uh, that are mostly using the money they are receiving either as equity or loans uh, for personal costs, uh, so not investing in machines, but uh, not in goods, but in, in, in hats, so to say, uh, they are using up this money. And um, if you have a quasi equity, it is uh, in the state aid regulation uh, or the definition for companies in difficulties, it is regarded as not being equity, even if you have a subordination. So at the point when you are signing the contracts, you have to make sure that there's enough equity left in a company that you do not have a, a company in difficulties. One thing that might help is if it's a very young company, uh, you get uh, some, I think it's uh, three years, if the company is young, younger than three years, uh, you uh, have an exemption. So you can give them, uh, they do not count as a company in difficulties. Uh, you don't look at the, the balance sheet to make this, this uh, assertion if it's a company in difficulties. So this might be an option for very young companies. But if the company is older and you have the situation that there's not enough equity, you have to be careful. Thank you very much. And let's move now to the last question from the conference. Another practitioner wondered if there was any guidelines uh, to use quasi-equity instruments in less developed markets. An example was mentioned about Western Balkans. Uh, is the small banking penetration rate in less developed markets a limiting factor to use quasi-equity instruments? Sarah. So when talking about this type of market, the high banking penetration is indeed a catalyst or even essential for the use of financial instruments such as loans or guarantees. Nevertheless, for equity and quasi-equity, the reference market is the equity market. Quasi-equity finance is usually provided not by banks, but by financial intermediary like equity or venture capital fund, the same as the equity providers. A functioning equity market is therefore important, more important than the banking system itself. We have mentioned earlier how the design and implementation of a first ERDF equity instrument has proven effective to support the development of such equity market. More specifically, it might represent the foundation to create a strong equity ecosystem or even reinforce when it's already existing. Sarah, Marcus, thank you very much for sharing these insights with us. Thank you very much, Anna, for having me and thanks for the very interesting question from the audience. Thank you too from my side. I very very good questions from your audience, and I'm was happy to share some of our experiences uh, regarding these uh, questions uh, from Berlin. And a big thank you also to the practitioners who raised those questions uh, we discussed today at the conference. And a big thank you also to all listeners for tuning in to today's episode of our Compass Gem Sessions podcast. We hope that this podcast will be helpful for many practitioners out there who may be considering implementing quasi-equity instruments in the 2021-27 programming period. And if you have any further questions or remarks on this or any other topics, we encourage you to get in touch with us through email 
contact at fee-compass.eu. We really look forward to hearing from you. And this brings today's episode to a close. Do not forget to follow us on social media and to look out for future editions of our podcast. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.